Welcome to Gotta Run. This is Will Sanchez. This is a very special episode of Gotta Run. First, my sponsorship was the Run Anyway Foundation. A few months ago, I had Lance and Todd as guests. They were so terrific that I decided to join them and supporting charities by running for them to raise funds. Check them out by going to hashtag 450 for the fallen or hashtag run anyway. Today, I have a very, very special guest. Her name is Katherine Switzer. I met Katherine seven years ago when my wife and I made a trek to do the Boilermaker 15K. To our surprise, Katherine Switzer was going to be on a discussion panel. We rushed over and noticed she was selling a book, Marathon Woman. And to our delight, Katherine served us the book. Ever since, she's been our radar screen, and I'm delighted to have her on the show. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you, Will. I'm really delighted to be here. I remember that day. It was so hot under that tent at the Boilermaker, and uh, it's amazing. Yeah, and that was the first year I was out with that book, Marathon Woman. I'm very interested to start by telling us about your parents. Well, that's how the book, of course, begins. And, uh, and I'm glad you asked, Will, because my parents were so seminal to everything uh, I am today. And I'd love to talk about them because... I would like every parent out there or every person who is potentially a parent to realize how important their influence is on a kid um, or any kid, you know, not necessarily their own. But my dad was an incredible positive reinforcer and my mother was extremely independent and they both raised me as a very independent, you can do anything kind of kid. Um, and my father, in terms of my running, uh, I love this story. I remember I came home one day and, and I said to him that I wanted to make the field hockey team in my high school. I was only 12. I was skinny or glasses and I was very prepubescent. And, um, and he said, well, honey, why, why don't you? You can make the field hockey team. And I said, no, I can't, Dad. I've never played that before. And he said, all you have to do is run a mile a day. And I went through all the histrionics. You know, I can't run a mile a day, Dad. That's like climbing Kilimanjaro. And he said, sure you can, honey. Our yard is, you know, a third of an acre. And if you, we figured it out mathematically. If you run seven laps, you run a mile. And I know you could do that right away. Everything was always positive. And I went out and I ran this mile a day and it changed my life. There you go. Just that simple thing. Sure, I made the field hockey team, but what my dad didn't know was going to happen and I didn't know was that I became empowered. You know, I had the, a victory under my belt every day that nobody could take away from me. And at 12 years old and going into a big high school, you know, like sitting next to the captain of the football team who was 18. And, <laughs> you know, these kids were adults and I was just I was still playing with dolls. And yet I had that mile a day under my belt. And I said, I'm you know, I'm strong. And it gave me the courage to do everything else in my life. You just, you just build on it. It was that amazing. That's great. I remember in the book, yeah. the other women on your team weren't as athletically inclined as you were. You sometimes had to do double the work. Yeah. In fact, after the a hockey practice, every day I would go out and I would run more. And then I would I start playing basketball and then, you know, it, 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 lacrosse. And then when I went to Syracuse University, which is the next part of the story, by the time I got to Syracuse, you know, I was running three miles a day. I was king of the hill. I, and, of course, I had no idea that the guys there at Syracuse were, were all scholarship boys and that they were very, very fast and, and they were, you know, you know, national class athletes. Um, but the other awakening I had from this was that at Syracuse, there was no uh, collegiate sports for women. You know, all Before the title nine. Yeah, this is way title nine. We're talking 1966 here, and 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 the guys had you know huge scholarship sports. I mean, it was Larry Zonka and Floyd Little playing football, and there was lacrosse, there was wrestling, there was basketball, basketball. Girls had play days, and so I went and asked the men's track coach if I couldn't run on his team, and he was quite <laughs> staggered by that, and he said. Um, well, he said it's against NCAA rules, but you'd be welcome to come and work out with the team, thinking I'd never show up. But I'd been running three miles a day by then, and I was empowered, and mm -hmm. I showed up. 
And um, it's in the rest again is history. You know, the guys were wonderful to me, very welcoming to me on the team. And the assistant track coach, who was not really a track coach, but was the university mailman, was a guy by the name of Arnie Briggs, who had the upstate New York record in the marathon. Mm -hmm. And he lived his life to run the Boston Marathon every year. So he would regale me with stories about Boston, and then came the day I said I wanted to run the Boston Marathon. So how many runners out there grew up like I did on stories of Clarence DeMar and Tarzan Brown and Johnny Kelly, the elder and younger, because Arnie had run with these guys. Yeah. And so, I mean, and it was Boston who made you the hero in your life for that mm -hmm. day, and your name was in the paper, and people would cheer for you. So, of course, I said, well, I want to run the Boston Marathon, too. And, of course, most of our audience probably know women weren't allowed to run marathons or more further than a mile and a half or something like Absolutely, that. but that's not what Arnie said to me at, in practice one night in a snowstorm. In Syracuse, it always snowed. You know, God invented snow and took it to Syracuse. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and he said, a woman can't run the marathon. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, it's too long, it's too difficult. And I said, I'm running 10 miles in a blizzard. He said, that's not 26. And he never said women weren't allowed. And I said, I know I can do it if I train up for it. And he said, a woman can't train up to 26 miles. And I said, Roberta Gibb ran the Boston Marathon last year. He exploded. He said, no dame ever ran no marathon. Now let's get going. And I said, and I'm not running unless you believe it. And he said, if you show me in practice, I'd be the first person to take you to Boston. Secret of success, right? right. Have a challenge and have a goal. Right. And I had a coach too and a buddy. Arnie. Yeah, I had Arnie. Well, Roberta Gibb, he was running it as a rogue runner. He would go in the back and just... Yeah, but she still ran it. Right, right. You know, he didn't believe it, though. I right. think a lot of people didn't. Right. And, and then when I showed Arnie in practice that I could do the distance, it took us all day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but we did it. We didn't walk one step. Um, when, we, when we finished, um, actually, we ran 31 miles. When we finished the 26, he said, I can't believe you did this. I said, well, let's, let run, let's run another five miles to be sure we right, measured right. correctly. He passed out at the end of the workout. I threw my arms around him. I said, we're going to Boston. He passed out. And he came to and he said, women have hidden potential in endurance <laughs> and stamina. And um, true to his word, though, he helped me sign up for the race. And he came over with a race application in my dorm, and I paid my $2 entry fee, and, and I wrote down my AAU number, but I signed my name KV Switzer. And when the, when the entry blank went in with Arnie's, they assumed I was a guy. Right, there the was no gender team. marking there on were, it. Uh, no, they assumed it was male. Well, if they assumed it was male, and they also assumed that no woman could, could run it and that no woman would want to run it. No woman in her right mind would want to run it. I had also had a medical certificate from my doctor at Syracuse University. Well, I remember he was excited when you told he was, him. Yes, exactly. He said, I remember the days of Clarence DeMar. Um, and he made me run up and down the steps, and he said, fit as a fiddle. <laughs> so these guys were very supportive. And how lucky I was. There were plenty of people who gave me a hard time, but the people who mattered didn't, right. and that was really important. Now, in your, in your book, you mentioned that, to your surprise, a lot of women were not supporting you. Yeah, you know, that's the sad part of the women's movement. For a long time, women were their own worst enemies. Women gave me the hardest time. And I, and I remember once, Arnie and I were out running together, and, um, and it, somebody tried to run us off the road, and it was a, a woman. A woman driver, yeah. And, and I said, why is it always a woman? And he said, because they're afraid. And we're going to fast forward a little bit about women being fearless. Mm -hmm. You know, at the end of this, this right. interview today, I want to tell you about a movement that I'm doing now called 261 Fearless. And 261, that's the bib you wore in your that's first Boston. The, that's the bib I wore in my Boston Marathon. It's come to mean fearless. And Arnie said that day, he said, it's because they're afraid. And I said, oh, Arnie, all they have to do is put on a pair of shoes and go out and run. Yes. And he said, you knew, know that. I know that they don't know that. Right. And he should have said they don't know that yet because when I, you know, through my career as I tried to uh, and did get many women's events organized and started and even into the Olympic Games, um, those women became like I did, empowered mm -hmm. and fearless. Mm -hmm. They just had to take the first step. And that's really what it's all about. Right. Yeah. Well, everybody knows or should know about the first Boston. You were, you were there running it and something happened. Somebody tried to 
get you off the course. Yeah, okay, well, so bib number 261, and I, I pinned this on, uh, on my front and back. I was very, very excited. Snowy and sleety day. I was in a baggy warm-up suit. That was probably one of the reasons why I even got to the start line. I got the numbers, um, I guess, because they thought K.V. Switzer was a man. Right. I signed my name K.V. Switzer because I thought it was two reasons, because it was cool. I wanted to be like J.D. Salinger. I wanted to be a great writer. Uh, e. E. Cummings. E. E. And T.S. Eliot. And also because, you know, here, my dad misspelled my name. He left the E out of the Catherine. So all, It's not a typo. <laughs> so all my life, Catherine has been misspelled. So I started signing K.V. Switzer. And Arnie and I and our teammate John from the, the you know, cross-country team was there. And Big Tom, my boyfriend, the ex-All-American football player, um, decided he was going to run at the last minute, having never run more than a mile in practice, because uh, he was a hammer thrower. Okay. Right. And it was interesting. He was able to get in without uh, qualifying or with the qualifiers in those days? No, anybody could come. Okay. Yeah. No, no, no. This Pay is the way. $2. Pay your $2 if you're an AAU member. We went as a team. But, but Tom decided like two weeks before the race that he was going to do it because I told him that I had run 26 miles in practice. And he said, if a girl can do it, I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Another story. Anyway, yeah, so we started the race together, and it was terrific. The guys in the starting pen were, were wonderful to me. And then the, the story goes, everybody knows the story. It's a legend in the world now of running. Um, two miles into the race, Jock Semple, who was the feisty old race, race co-director, jumped off the press bus and attacked me and tried to pull me out of the race and pull off the bib numbers. And he's uh, On the back. Uh, well, he tried the front first, and I jumped back, okay. and then I went ahead, but he because he had me by the shirt, and he then reached and snatched down like that, and he that's where he got the corner. Oh, this is the actual bit. Uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> I that love when people say it's not the actual bit. bit. <laughs> but he got the back, and it sort of flapped during the the rest of the race. But of course, everybody knows that um, then Arnie's screaming at him, "Leave her alone! She's okay. I've trained her." But Tom, my boyfriend, didn't wait, wait for any, any introduction. He just came, smacked right. Jock Semple and sent him flying out of the right. race. And, and Arnie uh, yelled, run like hell, and down the street we went. <laughs> and we laugh about it now. Even you're laughing. I know. But I you know. can imagine how terrible it oh, was at the time. It must have been terrifying. It was. It was terrible at the time. And I was crying, and, and Tom was furious, and Arnie was upset. And, and, and the, but the guys all around us were, were very angry right. that it had happened. Right. Uh, m more significantly for you and me now as journalists to realize was that it happened in front of the press truck. And from that came a series of pictures that, uh, uh, in fact, the most famous of which is a three-part series of pictures taken by Harry Trask. The pictures so captured this whole incident that they, they went around the world that very night um, and were in all the papers of the world. And now it's in Time Life's book, 100 Photos That Changed the World. That's right. That's because right. it has become a social revolution. And, and now, of course, in, again, getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, there are more women runners now in the United States, even in North America, than men. That is a social revolution. Absolutely. And, and, and it's, it's about the whole empowerment. It's not just about women's liberation. It's about women themselves discovering their own sense of destiny and strength. And it's about men also recognizing that. And men have been a wonderful part of this movement. And I, I often say that, that men and women running together has been one of the best things that's happened to society. Absolutely. And it's, it's been fantastic. I mean, and I organize women's races know, for a reason. Uh, and that's not to exclude men, but to include women. Yeah. Interesting that Jock picked the right moment to do his thing because it actually helped. As yeah. it turned out, years and years later, he became a friend. I know. I often used to introduce him as the man who, in spite of himself, has done more for women's long distance running than anybody else. And uh, we became good friends, but it took five years. Will we were, I know. We I were know. like this for you five You avoided years. him. Yeah. I was scared of him. I mean, he was out of control then, and he often got out of control. He was a feisty guy. Mm -hmm. But in the end, it was Jock who saw the light when... We campaigned to become official in 1972. What a year 72 was. Wow. We became official in 1972. Jock had to welcome us into the race. He was still furious. Um, I was third in the race. He gave me, had to give me a trophy. It was a broken trophy. Um, he apologized for that. But then he took a look at what the women had done, how we had worked hard, campaigned hard to get there, how well we ran. Eight of us met the then qualifying standard of 330. It was very tough. tough. This was 1972. It was 3.30 then. And we met that standard, and he was impressed. 
Now, let me jump okay. forward from why that was so important in 1972. After that, a sponsor came forward to Fred Lebo, the founder of the New York City Marathon, and said, look at this, women can run a marathon. We ought to have a women's only marathon to launch our product. This is Johnson's Wax, and they had a product called Crazy Legs shave cream for women to shave their legs with. And Fred said, well, there are only eight women who can really run this marathon. Um, let's make it shorter and call it a mini marathon because the mini skirt was in fashion then. And Fred, as you remember, was in the garment trade, That's the right. rag trade. That's right. It was a 10K. And it was a 10K around Central Park. Including a couple of Playboy buddies. Yes, a couple of Playboy buddies because Fred wanted to get publicity. And, and he said, they're not really going to run. They'll just come to the starting line. And Nina Cusick and I, you know, who are also founders of this race, are saying, all right, Fred, we know that you've <laughs> got to get publicity out here. But, but I brought my T-shirt today from that race. Oh. Nina was number one. I was number two. Look at this. Look at that. Right. I still Is wear it. it. It, uh, um, occasionally drag it out and it was amazing that that race became really suddenly gave us the idea of what women's running could do because 78 women showed up to run we suddenly realized maybe what women need also is an unintimidating empowering experience where they're very very mm -hmm. included and so that gave me the idea to create a women's only running program that that's how the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, is going to accept women's running because we could go globally to do that and women then would feel that they were accepted That's and right. gave them the courage then to enter mixed races That's later. Right. In fact, your best ideas came through you doing running. I know. And sometimes you would dash and write it down on a piece of paper and put it in a shoebox. I had these ideas every night on the long runs about how I could create this program. And I would write these ideas down as soon as I got in for my workout because as everybody knows, as soon as you get in and take a shower, you forget all those great ideas. That's right. So I quickly would write them down on bits of paper, whatever was around, cocktail napkins or you know, matchbook covers or whatever. And, and they were all over the place, mess. So I started putting them in a, in a shoe box. And when it came time then to put it all together to write a proposal. For Avon. For Avon. Avon had asked me, um, Avon Cosmetics, the, the world's largest cosmetics company at the time. Avon Calling. Yeah, Avon name. Calling. Then it was a direct selling company. I'll write a proposal for them. They'll never accept it. But it's a great practice. And I got out all those ideas. They were great ideas. Your ideas on the run are fantastic. So I put this proposal together. I took it to Avon. They loved it and they hired me. And it was really to do tennis and one running event. And the one running event turned out to be the first really, truly international, global women's only marathon in, in Atlanta, Atlanta in right. 1978. And Jeff Galloway was somehow involved Je in that. Yeah, Jeff Galloway, Bill Neese, Richard Calmes, and, and the great Dr. David Martin, who used that as beginning to get oh, scientific. I see, to give medical a, evidence, uh, uh, medical yeah. research that yeah. backed up yeah. that women could do this. Yeah. And all of the women there were part of cause to get the women's marathon into the Olympic Games. That's what we were really fighting for. And, we, and then I thought, my gosh, if I could take this global company and create events in different countries, we could lobby then the different international federations and get them on side to lobby the IOC. That's exactly what happened. Eventually, I, I know, but but I want to also mention, through the Avon Marathon, was the first time that all finishers got medals. That's right. That we now enjoy that. Yeah, well, part of this was because of my experience in running in Boston and these other events, and that in Boston in those days, the, only the first thirty-six men got medals. And I said, yeah, everybody who sense. finishes should get okay, a medal. That's right. So that was unique. It was. And we also created giving women not a trophy, but a piece of jewelry. And I thought that's something they could wear forever and feel proud of. Well, Nike stole in that because they have the Tiffany. And I know. The Nike I know. That's okay. San Francisco. Imitation is the highest form Almost of flattery. flattery. Absolutely. And I also, I think, I didn't realize there were no mile markers in Boston in those days. But you guys started that. Well, again, Avon. I was so annoyed, you know, that at Boston there were no water stations or no toilets, no, no measurements on the course for years. You know, we didn't have stopwatches either. We'd set our watches at noon. But we would get a basic splits. And I actually had friends that, that became part of my team. And they would be there at 5, 10, 15, 20, et cetera, giving me my splits. But I decided in my dream race that I was going to make sure it was incredibly accurately measured. One of my greatest heroes was Ted Corbett, who pioneered accurate course measurement. And I said, all of my Avon races are going to be exactly right. 
every water station is going to be right. Everything is going to be up to IOC standards because the IOC didn't really want women's distance running, you see. But if you did it absolutely perfectly, that's one thing they couldn't refute you on. So then if you had everything that was exactly perfectly done and you went to every athletic federation to get athletes there and did it right, they couldn't argue with that. They couldn't ever say you did it wrong. <laughs> um, they couldn't ever say there were men in the race because they were helping the women. These women were doing it on their own. And then from country to country to country, we did that. And through it was Avon. Through Avon. So that just exploded. It was called the Avon International Running Circuit. And for, you know, we had that first program last, it was for eight years. And, um, and, and we eventually had 27 countries, five continents, um, and over a million women participating. Right. And the, it changed those lives. The IOC was important in terms of getting the women's marathon into the Olympics. Yes, but we had to give them the data and the statistics. So we had it. We had the performances. We had the number of countries. We had all these courses measured perfectly. Um, and we had, the by this time, the IAAF on our side. They, they really, really helped us a lot. In one race in particular in London, we closed Avon Marathon, closed downtown London streets for the first time in history for a sports event before the London Marathon. It actually was kind of a design model for what is now the London Marathon. And um, we took these statistics then in a report to the IOC, worked with Peter Uberoth at, in Los Angeles, the Los Angeles Olympic Games, mm -hmm. and um, got the IOC to vote the women's marathon in for 1984. It was extraordinary, Will, because wow. we went from 1,500 meters in the previous Olympics to 3,000 and the marathon in the 84 Olympics. 84. It was amazing. And, uh, and uh, tell us about that marathon. I think Joan oh, Bennett was... Uh, it was it was phenomenal. And, and your role there was, what, as a, as a commentator? Yeah, I, I wound up... A new up career. A new career, a new career. ABC asked me to do the commentary for that race. And it was, um, I, it was hard for me because I had to be objective. And I was very emotional, naturally, about it. But I was very objective. And I, and I was cheering as much for let's say, Ingrid Christensen and, and Greta Weitz, and as I was for Joan Benoit, because my world was global. And, um, and, and in fact, a lot of us felt as heroic as Joan Benoit Samuelson was in the Olympic trials, because she had had knee surgery only 17 days before, that she couldn't possibly wow. foot it. 17 she couldn't, days? Yeah, 17 days before. She didn't realize it was so quick. Yeah, yeah, but, but she, we felt that she couldn't possibly foot it with Ingrid Christensen and Greta Weitz uh, in the Olympics. That the knee, as good as it was, wasn't going to hold up, but right. she blew the hinges off the race. And, you know, she took the race by the throat from the beginning and ran a really a wire-to-wire -wire victory. It was phenomenal. Uh, and I end my book on, on that, that moment when she came into the Olympic Stadium and, and said, you know, she, she went from the shadows of the tunnel right, right. into the white hot heat of world acclamation in and, the stadium. And she still runs today. Oh my God, isn't she wonderful? I mean, <laughs> she she's, might, she's the, qualifies for the Olympics. I tell you, yeah, she's, she's actually rewriting history as we speak with over her age group running, you know, uh, records. Phenomenal. But the most important thing, Will, about those women coming into that Olympic stadium was that the world saw them on television. And every country in the world knows... This is the Olympics, yes. Yes, but every country knows how far 26.2 or 42.2 kilometers is. And, and they know it's far. Uh, you see, was, you, you know, you and I could sit in the stands and we can watch a 400 meters, okay? Hmm. And you, with your expert eye and mine with mine, cannot tell 52 seconds from 48 seconds, oh, okay? That's true. Okay, but everybody knows how far 26.2 .2 miles is. But let's... let's uh, Fast forward again because uh, we want to make sure we cover the events that after this book came out, we were in 2007. Seven. My well, gosh. the book ends on the 84 Olympics. Originally, Marathon Woman, Woman was going to be a two, two volume book. Uh -huh. And my publisher said, even Bill Clinton can do it in one. <laughs> so it ends in 84. My husband, the great love of my life, only makes the epilogue. <laughs> right, that's right. So it that's is right. time for volume two, I know. Cause Actually, Will, so much has happened since 84. It's just been phenomenal. Well, what are the highlights? The highlights are that, the, that suddenly after 84, there has been in North America, especially the United States, an explosion in women's running where there are more women runners now than men. That's all because of health, empowerment, 
it may be weight loss, but it has comes down to empowerment and comes to it, to a global community. Mm-hmm. Um, this is spreading around the world, and it, in it, it, I talked about fearlessness. It's a method of communication, uh, women with each other of empowerment, being fearless and changing their lives in every aspect, not just running. It gives them the courage to change their lives in every possible way. Mm-hmm. And and we have seen women who didn't have a pair of shoes in Brazil, and I'm not talking about Nikes or Reeboks, who were so poor they didn't have a pair of shoes, changing their lives from running because they feel they are somebody. And if you believe you are somebody, you are somebody. And we've seen it, lives transformed in, in Japan, where women were, w- w- there were no heroines in Japan. Who's winning the gold medal? The Japanese women. Mm-hmm. And that has become, they become rock stars. It's women's running now that's big in Japan. It used to be practically a religious cult among men. Mm-hmm. Now it's the women who are dominating. Look at Africa. Oh. Those women, third class citizens, now they're taking the money back and building schools and sanitizing water mm-hmm. and, and inoculating kids. They're transforming the society, mm-hmm. Will, mm-hmm. and it's happening everywhere. And what's interesting is, is I told you about this, this bib number has gone viral and there's this organic movement of 261 becoming fearless, especially among women runners. What effect do you have it on your slack? Well, it's also become a line of sportswear. Let's thank Skirt Sports for jumping on this idea of creating sportswear that helps empower women. You know, if you have clothing that gets you out on the road or shoes or whatever, anything that gets you out on the road moving and empowers you helps. So we have a new clothing line. We've just launched at Boston this year, 261 Fearless with Skirt Sports. And and maybe um, also... Um, just as exciting is um, an old friend of mine from Spain, Jose Luis Carrera, came to me and he said, we don't have a women's marathon anymore in Europe. I said, what? We don't. You're right. He said, we're going to do one in southern Spain. Southern Europe is underserved with women's Mm -hmm. running. We're going to say, call it the 261 Women's Marathon. And the theory is we know about challenge. We're going to give you a challenge and you're going to rise to the occasion. We had this race on March 30th in Mallorca. This year? This year. 700 women, 25 countries. And they're wow. all there because they understand the power of that 261 movement, of, wow. of the sense of fearlessness. I've never seen such spirit before. These wow. women, it's, it's not just about winning a race. It's about creating a global method of communication and community, women to woman. Now we're going to go even further. We have gone even further creating a global network of clubs, training, communication, and we're going to reach women who've never been touched before. And all my life I've wanted to, to give women in the Mideast a chance to get from behind the veil, and I think we can do it. You are doing it. Oh, yeah, we are doing it. Listen, on that note, thank you so much for coming in and sharing all these wonderful stories. Thank you, Will, for having me. Wish you great success in all your endeavors. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.